Barb, you're muted. Okay. Um, I will start that again. Good evening and welcome. This is the second virtual comprehensive plan workshop for the city of Frederick. And um, Brandon Mark from the city's planning department plan is workshop with for the us. He's city the of process. Frederick. He's and the um, manager of community Brandon Mark planning from and the city design when I planning department plan workshop is for the city of Frederick and, uh, and subject matter. Brandon Mark from, from the city design when I um, so the process that we'll be going through tonight is the planning staff uh, will introduce the overview, will walk us through it and give a presentation of the overview. And then we will do the roll call of the planning commissioners for questions, comment, and discussion about that part of the chapter. Then we'll take each policy one by one. We'll have the presentation of the policy and the implementation points, and then we'll do a roll call of the commissioners again for questions, comment, and to have a discussion on each of the policies. At the end of the chapter, we will open this up for public comment. And we'll say this number a number of times throughout, but the number for public comment is 301600. One, two, one, three. Whoops, it is not that. Thank you very much. This is a different number. Um, it's 929 229 5669. And the conference ID you will be asked for is 240 04261 pound. So, um, at this point, I'm going to take a roll call of the commissioners so we we know who is here at this time. We will I'll then turn it over to Brandon. Again, he'll introduce the team that is with him. We'll do a group swearing in. And um, then if anybody's on the line now, or actually this is being viewed over YouTube, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so if anybody's on here now um, and you plan to call in for public comment, you will need to say your name, your address, and then I will swear you in. So at this point, let's do um, a roll call of commissioners. Commissioner Burns. Uh, Commissioner Burns, here in paradise, present. Commissioner Manalis. Commissioner Manalis, present. Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell, I am present. Great, and Commissioner Nicholas is here. So we'll, we will turn this over to Brandon Mark. Now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being flexible and uh, attending this meeting virtually. Um, as uh, Chairwoman Nicholas said, uh, this is our fifth workshop. So far we've covered introduction, land use, uh, transportation, water resource, historic preservation, environmental sustainability, Housing, Parks and Rec, Economic Development, and Fiscal Chapter. Uh, tonight, we'll be discussing community character and urban design. Uh, with us tonight is Joe Atkins, the Deputy Director for Planning, Christina Martinkowski, uh, one of our Historic Preservation Planners, and Arash Garamani, who is our Urban Designer. Just want to remind everybody who may be watching um, that on Tuesday, May 26th at 6 p.m. in this format, uh, we'll be discussing the municipal growth chapter. On June 1st at 6 p.m., Monday, June 1st at 6 p.m., we'll be discussing the implementation chapter. Uh, Tuesday, June 9th at 6 p.m., we'll be discussing the roadway classification map. And lastly, on uh, June 22nd at 6 p.m., we'll be discussing the proposed land use map and the reclassification requests. Um, with that, if you have don't have any questions, I will get into the chapter. Uh, we do have to do a group swearing in. That's right. Correct. Okay. So um, all of you um, on on the planning staff that plan to speak, if you'd raise your right hand. 
do you solemnly swear or affirm that the responses given in statements made in this hearing before the planning commission will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth if so say i do and if you could say your name then i do starting with mark i do joe adkins i do arash garmani i do christina martin kosky i do now the floor is back with you brandy great thank you um, so this is an exciting chapter. Um, a lot of hard work has been put into it, and I thank uh, Christina and Arash for teaming up with me uh, to prepare it. Um, let me share screen and pull this up here. Um, so basically, um, a lot has been expanded in this chapter since 2010. Um, we are making a recommendation uh, to establish conservation districts in neighborhoods where applicable. And then obviously we've been talking this whole process um, for months about establishing form-based codes where appropriate. Um, generally chapters organ organized um, to give a history of the identi identity of the city, uh, what makes our neighborhoods great from a design perspective, um, some threats uh, to community character and design, and then the tools we recommend to mitigate against uh, those threats. Um, with that being said, oh, I might be having some technical difficulties here. Okay, here we go. Um, I'll jump into, uh, this is page uh, 6154 of the layout, um, the guiding design principles for consistent urban form. Uh, basically, the three most important uh, design principles uh, when you are thinking about our neighborhoods is street frontage, uh, streetscapes, and building types. So basically, the street frontage is the area between the building and the street. The streetscape is the amenities that is provided either in the public right-of-way or private uh, areas. So that may be uh, landscaping, benches, trash cans, sidewalks, etc. And then the building type is the mass uh, scale location of the buildings uh, in comparison to the right of way. So when you think about our city, and I'll just paint a picture uh, between different neighborhoods, you know, you have Market Street, which is four or five, uh, three, two, three, four, five stories high um, versus uh, and, and pushed up against a street with wide sidewalks and, and landscaping versus second, third, fourth street, which they may be set back a little bit from the sidewalk, have patios, um, stoops, uh, landscaping, two to three stories. And then you move elsewhere in our, our city, Rockwell Terrace, where they have deed restrictions that they have to maintain a certain setback. Um, and then landscaping requirements. I think they, I think their deeds even require them to have um, their street trees. Um, and then other areas, uh, let's think uh, Trail Avenue, um, where you have two-story row houses that are set back even uh, further from the street. Dill Avenue, Rosemont Avenue, and Baker Park. All these areas in our, our city, uh, they're very different and each one of these three uh, design characteristics. So all three are different in street frontage, building type, and streetscape. And they're the three most important when uh, we consider urban design and the character of all of our neighborhoods. Um, next is uh, architecture. Um, this is less important outside of the historic preservation overlay. Um, this focuses on the individual buildings. Um, so materials, fenestrations, roof lines. Um, fenestration is uh, the placement of windows, doors, um, the patterning of those. Um, <clears throat> then uh, next is, uh, let's see, open space and public amenities. Um, these are parks, plazas, gardens that act as public gathering spaces. Um, uh, the next is, um, let's see, parking and Basically, this is the uh, placement and design and number of parking spaces required for residential and commercial areas in the city. Um, it's important to um, 
understand that parking is more than just uh, automobiles and vehicles. Um, this includes bicycle parking and other types of modes of transportation. Um, the city blocks, this influences the walkability of neighborhoods. Um, we talk about this a little bit later in the chapter, um, so I'll save that discussion for then. And then um, transition areas. So typically, um, let's see, traditional Euclidean zones, the transition area is designed to be between um, different land uses. So oftentimes we have buffer requirements, which requires spacing and landscaping in between that. Um, where we're trying to get into is instead of having um, spacing and landscaping requirements to buffer against various land uses that you transition from the street frontage, the street streetscapes and the building types, which would allow us to flow from more urban to suburban uh, areas uh, more cohesively. Um, next is neighborhood gateways, and this ties uh, into the land, land use chapter as well. Um, these are points of interest between neighborhoods and transition areas. Um, so you might have uh, different neighborhood gateways between East Frederick and the Golden Mile, South Market Street, North Market Street, and various areas of the city. Um, and then lastly is skylines and scenic vistas. It's important that when we review new developments or infill redevelopment that we cherish uh, the, the vistas and scenic views that our city has. And that is uh, mainly <coughs> the clustered spires um, and the Catoctin Mountains, but it also includes other historic areas of the city as well. Um, the chapter then goes into considerations for infill development. And this has really been a priority of this plan. Um, we, we've stressed that um, we want to concentrate redevelopment and infill development in tier, tier one, then move to tier two, which is the areas outside of the current city boundary, but within the Potomac River Water Service Agreement. And then lastly, allow annexations um, at, at certain points um, in the future. So, um, there's three types of considerations to ensure that infill development is cohesive with our existing environment, and that's to ensure that it's compatible. Um, so when we review an infill development, we want to make sure that, that the streets are similar to the surrounding streets, um, that the lot sizes and their patterns are, are similar to neighboring uh, lots, as well as the setbacks. <clears throat> And then we want to ensure that the neighborhood's connected. Um, we want the connections um, be to be either vehicular to um, connect to existing roadways of adjacent neighborhoods or um, shared use paths, sidewalks, et cetera, for pedestrians and bicyclists. Lastly, when we consider in infill development, we want to make sure that um, what is being proposed there, we call it community core, and that's spaces for the, the new residents to gather. Um, so that's either at schools, playgrounds, parks, institutions, such as churches, community centers, et cetera. Um, so we talk a little bit about that, and then we get into um, the threats to community character, and we name six six threats to community character. And that's uh, the first one's placeless architecture. Um, this really, uh, I guess to summarize it, uh, a threat are, are stark buildings. Um, so if you think about the Golden Mile, we may have uh, buildings that were constructed in the 1970s that have a stark appearance versus um, some newer buildings, uh, let's say up on 26. Um, these, this placeless architecture has little interaction with um, the sidewalks or the street front. Um, they're, they're designed uh, without uh, vernacular architecture. A lot of times you'll see corporate architecture that really doesn't fit in uh, with our neighborhoods or, or our streetscape. The next is visual clutter or lack of identity. Um, this is the abundance of a lot of signage, um, incohesive signs, 
large parking lots um, and many distractions. This could be even uh, utilities as well. The next is uh, large parking lots. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a threat, but it's also an opportunity. Um, so large parking lots, um, they, they create voids in our community. Um, there's a perception of blight when uh, you see these large parking lots. If, again, I'll, I'll mention uh, the Golden Mile when you're driving down the Golden Mile, Kmart, the mall, um, you see these large parking lots and, and you don't see a lot of activity. Um, even though businesses are doing well, there's a perception that um, maybe it's not uh, as lively as maybe downtown. Um, but as I mentioned, a lot of times these parking lots, um, as we evolve as a society, will give us the opportunity for infill or redevelopment at a, at a de denser FAR. Um, the next is teardown and incompatible replacement. Um, this is a big addition to this plan, and we'll talk about it more in the, the conservation development uh, section. Um, this is basically the demolition of older homes because they're in a location where maybe the property values have or the, the housing prices have risen to the point where a modest house um, could be economically torn down and uh, a new home could be built uh, that, that is, makes sense for uh, certain individuals. Um, these new homes are, are modern. Um, suburban type of uh, architecture and um, generally do not fit in um, with our neighborhoods. Um, when I think about teardown and incompatible replacement, I instantly think about um, Kensington and Chevy Chase, Maryland, where they've gone through a lot of this. Um, there's streets um, in Kensington where you'll see very modest 1940s, 1950s homes um, that have either additions that fit in or additions that aren't compatible um, because they're massing in scale, or you'll just see a, a, a row of modest homes um, with a huge suburban teardown replacement in, in that street. Um, I'd ask some of you, if you have time to just Google Street View Kensington and just go through that there. You can see an aerial, um, the, the impacts that it's had. had. Um, the next <clears throat> is Euclidean zoning. Um, Euclidean zoning, as we all know, um, really segregates land uses and um, it requires vehicular transportation in between those and doesn't really allow um, for a cohesive neighborhood. And Lastly is inadequate and disconnected transportation op options. Um, this is the lack of complete streets, emphasizing automobile travel, um, heavy peak time traffic, increased infrastructure, expenses and liabilities to serve those neighborhoods. Um, when we went through this chapter, obviously uh, we, we, just, we determined some tools that would help us um, combat or mitigate uh, these threats and the tools that um, we proposed are historic districts, which we as a city have one of the best in the states, um, conservation districts and form-based code. And we're lucky enough to have Christina here uh, this evening um, to give us a general history of uh, our historic district and what what its advantages are, and then really get into conservation districts and what we're, we're proposing with uh, that as well. So go for it, Christina. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Brandon. So I guess we want to start off the conversation just acknowledging that um, historic districts aren't for everywhere, right? It's really reserved for um, the rare um, collection of buildings, a district or individual uh, lots, um, a landmark, meet uh, really high criteria for designation. Um, our local designation meets the National Register criteria, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But basically, to be locally designated, you both have to have 
historical significance and historic integrity. And the vast majority of properties in Frederick just don't meet that really high level uh, to be eligible for historic uh, preservation overlay uh, designation. Um, to have significance, you either have to have um, some sort of association with an important event, um, like the Schley House on East Patrick Street. Um, it uh, is associated with events leading up to um, the Battle of Antietam. Or it can be a longer series of events, like uh, the Frederick City Canning Company, who uh, operated for a long time and really revolutionized uh, our local economy and uh, uh, access to food. Uh, a site can also be associated with a really significant person, such as the, Rod, uh, the Roger Tawney House, or a building that really exemplifies specific characteristics of a, of a certain type, period, or method of construction. If you recall recently, uh, the Mayor and Board of Aldermen last year designated um, a property on Linden Hill because it was a great example of a cure cottage, which is associated uh, with certain design characteristics to combat uh, tuberculosis. Uh, another way you could be potentially designated is through archaeology. Um, although this is not a designated site, it's definitely potentially eligible, and that's the Mill Pond House, which is located in Mor Mormon's Mill. It's valuable for its archaeological importance and its ability to teach us um, about the very initial development from early settlers here in Frederick. But it's not only that property has to be significant and have historical or architectural significance. It also has to have integrity, historic integrity, which is its ability to uh, tell its story. It has to look somewhat like it did in the past. And that is really a hard and high standard to meet. Um, of course, we are known, um, well, before I get ahead of myself, there are two types of districts. Um, there is a national registered district, which is largely honorific. And then there's locally designated sites and districts. And um, in the city, again, our designation criteria for lo locally designated districts and landmarks mirror the criteria established um, by the National Park Service uh, and the National Register. Uh, so what characterizes a local district? Um, well, it is a, a zoning tool. It's an overlay zone, so it doesn't impact the base zoning. Uh, it's really creates a design review process with design guidelines uh, that are implemented by uh, city staff and a review body of the Historic Preservation Commission. It uh, generally prohibits demolition of historic buildings. And there is a very careful design review process of both Enville and any sort of uh, modification to the building or setting. Now, um, along with the um, extensive design review aspect, there's also a lot of incentives about uh, being associated with a historic district, including local and state and potentially federal tax credits. Uh, the city operates a 25% preservation tax credit for any sort of rehabilitation work on the exterior of the building. Uh, because you are, uh, if you live in a building that is designated or, or operate a business that's in a building that's designated, you also have access to uh, state uh, and federal grants, potentially local grants. Uh, you also have a level of protection and security, knowing that what you are investing in is uh, protected. And then you also have access to uh, technical assistance from city staff. Uh, as Brandon mentioned, we have one large historic district. It's one of the largest uh, and oldest districts um, in the um, the U.S. It is comprised of roughly 2,500 properties. We also have about a half, half a dozen individually listed uh, properties outside that historic downtown core. So to become designated, you both um, you have to meet that really high standard of historical or architectural significance architectural integrity. Um, but you also have to go through the designation process, which is both um, uh, a technical standard, but also a political process. It can be, the process can be um, uh, started by an application, which can come from an elected official, a commission member, or the commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, the planning uh, department, or if a group of owners representing 50% of more of the lots um, associated with the district uh, makes an application. Uh, currently, uh, the the main our main district uh, is going through. A, uh, we just received a grant to resurvey 
the district. Uh, the benefits of having that resurvey done is uh, we are going to have an expanded uh, understanding of our historic context. Right now, uh, our understanding of the historic district is ba mainly based off of the 1980. Uh, National Register survey done. It mentions nothing about African American history, women history, immigrant history. There's so many aspects of our history that were just left out of um, the story. So those stories need to be incorporated. We also need to reevaluate the boundaries to see if they need to be expanded or brought in. And we also get a contributing, non-contributing list out of that. What buildings actually contribute to the history of um, the district and what, what does not. Um, now, as I said, not every building and not every property is um, appropriate for historic preservation designation. Um, and there might be, but but they hold value. They, they have character uh, that sh that is valued, and um, there's tools to protect that value to protect that value. Um, and so that leads me into the neighborhood conservation district. Um, I can take a pause for any questions regarding local designation, if wanted. With that, I'll keep going. Why don't you keep on going? Sorry, I was just looking at a chat and it looked like Ron Burns, Commissioner Burns had to leave. His battery was um, going out. So, sorry. No, thank, thank you. Um, so I'll just move on to conservation districts. So. This is like a historic district. It is an overlay district. It um, goes over the base uh, zoning. Uh, right now, we don't have a uh, neighborhood conservation district. So that is something that we would have to establish in the land management code. Um, it is um, very different from a historic district. It is not a, a really great historic preservation tool, but it does have value. Be, um, it's intended to protect the character of an existing older neighborhood, but it doesn't invoke any of that, that high level regulatory review. That's uh, typically associated with the historic district. Um, one thing to note is that a neighborhood conservation district um, does not prohibit demolition. It, um, it does not include a, uh, a terribly uh, rigid design review process. It really looks at new construction, um, not alterations, and how it fits into the neighborhood. Um, and um, if I didn't mention it, 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 it does not pre prevent demolition. It just discourages it by creating a, uh, a standard of, of what new construction would look like in, in that um, existing neighborhood. So a neighborhood conservation district is uh, really should be applied to older developed residential neighborhoods with a, a distinctive physical characteristic that can be clearly defined. It doesn't, it's not tied to uh, historic significance or integrity like a historic district is. So you don't have to have historic significance or integrity uh, to be a neighborhood conservation district. You just have to have a distinguishable character. Um, Christina. Now, yeah. Alderman Russell here. I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask a question about that. Can you talk about, um, I guess, a, a little bit about what, what protections it does provide, what standards it does provide, and who is responsible for ensuring those standards are adhered to? Really, really good question. Um, so, the I'm sorry, the first question was, uh, what does it do? <laughs> Essentially, yes. What yeah. what does it do? We know what we know what historic preservation overlay does. This is yeah. a, a obviously a step down, but what does it accomplish? What are the benefits okay. of it? Okay, so it protects neighborhood character by um, creating. First step is to identify the area, right? A, a, a neighborhood that has a character, identifying that character and making sure that any new development that goes into it is in keeping with that character. So um, let's say there was a development that took place in 1965 with um, a lot of one story row homes with a setback of about a hundred feet uh, with large rear yards. All right, um, what we, what a neighborhood conservation district will do will discourage the militia in part because um, uh, you couldn't build potentially a two or three story 
massive uh, residential building that takes up the entire yard. Um, it really uh, makes sure that new development, including additions and secondary buildings, uh, accessory buildings, are in keeping with the scale and massing. Not so much, uh, there's not so much review of, of, of materials and fenestrations and details, but just kind of keeping the general feel of the neighborhood in, in, in terms of scale and massing. So to just follow up a little bit, you say first identify the neighborhood. Yeah. How does that happen? Well, in that part, it is very similar to how you would treat a, a, a historic district. You have to identify the area. Um, and, and since this is based on character, right, how, how that neighborhood looks, it's really going out and surveying, documenting the buildings. And also, it, it's just the overall feeling of, of neighborhoods can also be defined by uh, its top topography, its how, how streets are laid out. It really helps create the feeling of, of what that neighborhood character is. Um, it's also based on uh, uh, historic development. So um, an area can be clearly defined as by when it was platted and, and when it was developed and how it was developed. Okay, carry on, thank you. Uh, I was gonna say just as, as, as you speak, if you can talk about also uh, how is it enforced how does it start? And with all the tools that you had when we were looking at a particular um, item a couple years ago, uh, we got a list of all kinds of tools that the city of Frederick could choose. And um, if you could speak to as why this particular tool was chosen. Good questions. I do want to go over into um, how, how a conservation district would, would come to be. Um, this chart I, I obtained from the, Nash, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and they provided some good guidance on um, planning and administrative practices for, for this tool. Um, the first step is uh, creating an ordinance. Uh, we would create um, a general uh, designation criteria and administrative uh, process. We would do community outreach, education. Uh, we also talked about maybe creating like a very preliminary uh, uh, blueprint of what um, design guidelines would look like. They certainly wouldn't look like what you would have uh, in a historic district that's pretty expansive, maybe a 200 page document. Instead, we're looking at a couple page document. Again, we would move on to neighborhood survey to really identify the neighborhood characteristics, the building inventories, uh, and then um, presenting that information to the community and getting their feedback so we can prepare an application to designate it in creating the guidelines. Each individual property would be, um, or each individual uh, overlay district would uh, go through um, a, a review process, a designation process for the planning commission and the mayor board of aldermen. Um, and then individual ones are done um, again through the zoning map amendment. Um, when um, let's say somebody wanted uh, somebody owned a property in a neighborhood conservation district and they wanted to, uh, to add an addition, uh, what we are envisioning at this point is an administrative process that is handled by city staff. So the guidelines should be pretty prescriptive, right? Uh, the building should be this tall. There should be this much yard space. Uh, ad addition should not encroach upon beyond this level. Uh, new construction or accessory building should be located here and be this certain size. It should be pretty um, uh, formulaic uh, that um, an application can come in, be reviewed by staff uh, within a, a few days or a few weeks, and then processed uh, that way. I do not envision any sort of commission review or anything along associated with that. Does that explain the uh, the creation process and, and how it and how a, a project would be reviewed? Well, even before you get there, who actually starts the process? And then you talked about the community. Well, how Got do you define it. the community? And so then in, when when we uh, 
create a text minute creating the the ability for the the city to uh, create a neighborhood conservation district we would definitely outline who would be eligible and how i envision that is to to in a way mirror how the his, a historic district is created. Um, it can be created by uh, an application be, can be generated by the planning commission or the planning department or the neighborhood itself. Uh, the in a historic district, that standard is 50% of uh, the the residents in that neighborhood. I do foresee in 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 practice that it would actually most of the um, creation of a neighborhood conservation district would be implemented through the planning commission. We have the professional staff to, to, to create the application and um, it is a kind of a citywide kind of effort to, to protect these neighborhoods. And we would definitely um, be feeding off of uh, public input. So you envision uh, that the planning department, planning commission would initiate most of these and who would define the boundaries of the community and the you mentioned 50 percent too would that is there a percentage of how can i say does does there need to be agreement or how do you get agreement within the community well so the 50 percent is only required uh if an if the community wants to be the applicant um ultimately it's the mayor on board who who would make the decision on whether or not it's designated okay so applicant can either come from the community or come it, it can come from the planning department it can come from the city yes i um and then during that application process the creation process that's when the boundaries would be determined and the guidelines uh, be developed. Christina, if I may ask a question. Um, so do you envision the same sort of minimum buy-in from a percentage of the community for it to be able to move forward just as the HPOs or? Yeah. I, I do envision, and, and this is just preliminary conversations, that uh, it would be treated very much the same way of, of a historic district being created. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily require buy-in, uh, but we would, um, or, or full support of the community, but um, with a minimal level of uh, design review, a quick design review process, a predictable review process, um, with the created with creating security for property owners that, that when they buy into a neighborhood, that neighborhood will be maintained to a certain degree. Um, I do hope and I do think that we would get a lot of support. The enforcement of these, like with the neighborhood or with the hyster historic um, overlays there is a historic preservation committee or commission that reviews those. How does it work with these conservation districts? I'm envisioning this to be, um, the, the guidelines to be so defined and in, easy to implement that it, this could be something that could be reviewed on a staff level. So an application submitted within a few days or a few weeks that that review process is complete and the uh, a permit can be issued. If if there um, if somebody does not apply for a um, a, a review process for the um, neighborhood conservation district, it would be treated the same way as somebody not obtaining a permit or HPC approval. It would be handled through code enforcement or the building department to make sure that's resolved. Would any aspect of these neighborhood or of these uh, conservation districts would they become code? Or do they stay separate from the land management code? It, so, good question. So, first we would create the, the text amendment, which allows the city to designate uh, neighborhoods. And then it would be followed by individual map amendments uh, for the, the um, designated uh, neighborhood. So, that would be incorporated in the code, that that neighborhood is protected with an overlay. 
And so you would have to follow all the regulatory review associated with that overlay. I, I envision it keeping very much with the existing framework that we, we already have. Uh, Commissioner Pinellas, I know we didn't exactly um, follow the roll call, et cetera, and um, Alderman Russell and I have been jumping in asking questions. I want to make sure that whatever questions you have or comments, would you like, do you have any questions and comments at this point? Commissioner Manalis, yeah, I have um, some, I guess, questions and comments, but not related to that section. So I'm not sure if you want me to go ahead and talk about. Why don't we stay just on the conservation district at this time? And when we get to the end of the overview, then we'll do the roll call for overall okay. questions and comments. It's just, this is such a new concept and it's such Correct. a- Correct rich conversation that the commission has been engaged in for a couple of years. So I think that's why we're, we're asking so many questions. So Christina. And so, and, and so far, Christina has answered any questions that I would have in regards to that section. So Christina, if you want to complete whatever you were going to say then about that. Oh, I think, I think I'm done. And Brandon, um, are you done taking yes. us through the? No, we have um, one more tool and that's the form based code. Um, so that's the last tool that we um, introduced in uh, this chapter. And I'm going to share my screen as see if I can double share. Pardon me. So the last um, tool that we are presenting is the form based code. And uh, we've discussed this a lot along uh, our journey reviewing this uh, update. Um, I will say that um, it was in the budget and maybe Kelly um, can back me up here, but I think that our consultant um, allocation or our budget allocation for hiring a consultant form for form based code was uh, removed um, due to the uncertainties with COVID. Um, so we may um, take a hit there, but it's not like we can't proceed with um, other implementation measures of the comp plan. But um, basically a form based code is um, a type of zoning regulation, just like an over it's an overlay um, uh, where the uh, our standard Euclidean zone, um, you first look at land use and then you determine um, the development potential or the, the, the by right development um, regulations. Uh, form based code first starts with uh, form, building form, and then reviews uh, uses secondary where um, a lot of different uses, mixture of uses would be permitted. Um, it would only call out maybe uh, the prohibited uses. Um, so uh, the first step uh, with creating a form based code is called the regulating plan. Um, and this defines the desired character, intensity, and building form uh, that our community uh, commissioners and elected officials um, uh, have envisioned for that area. Um, the regulating plan is a detailed map that is based on um, either uh, street hierarchy or, or is based on street hierarchy and open spaces. And then the building forms come in secondary um, based on the that the streets and the open spaces. So um, oftentimes uh, the regulating plan is based on the transect, which you can see figure 6-3 here. It's um, the, the transition from urban spaces to rural spaces. Um, for our city, it would probably be a transition from uh, urban spaces to suburban uh, zones. Um, or a um, uh, regulating plan could be developed on streets and corridors. Um, and this uh, basically gets back to that uh, hierarchy. Um, Brandon, I'm sorry, is there a way you can zoom in on that uh, diagram a little bit? I can try, yep. Thanks. So these are just um, images we took from um, 
what was it, smart code, I believe. And this is a standard um, transect image. Um, but uh, if, if you think about our small area plans and the various um, areas we'd like to draft small area plans for, right now we have East Frederick and the Golden Mile. East Frederick might be designed in, with a, a transect in mind where the western boundary of East Frederick is downtown and the eastern bound or eastern boundary of uh, East Frederick is the airport and the county. Um, so we may um, tackle East Frederick small area plan with a form based code that goes into a transect and analyzes it from a transect perspective. But when you go to the Golden Mile, which is a uh, state highway uh, Route 40, we might look at it as a corridor where um, you have different street uh, hierarchy of streets. You have uh, Route 40, which is highly traveled, high speed. Um, and then you have Key Parkway, Butterfly Lane, um, different neighborhood streets that um, you can design buildings um, and, sh and frontages around that. So the regulating plan is really um, your first step in creating a form-based code. And um, I should mention that this is very laborious up front. So uh, community buy-in and figuring out your vision right off the bat is priority number one when you uh, go into designing a form-based code. Um, <clears throat> after uh, the right, well, we have this uh, diagram. Uh, it's our, our first stab at an urban form map. So we've laid out our downtown, our HPO, all the various um, small area uh, plan areas, as well as major street corridors and neighbor, neighborhood street corridors. So when you, you look at our city, you can quickly figure out um, where a form-based code makes sense and how to draw those boundaries. And this also goes and ties back into the land use chapter where we expanded the small area plans. So um, when we get to that point and implementation, uh, we can easily determine the boundaries, create our stakeholder groups and tackle each neighborhood at a time. I think we've mentioned before that our priorities at this time should be East Frederick and, and Golden Mile. Um, next is the development standards. So uh, the development standards really mirror what we discussed earlier as what makes uh, community character and or the guiding design principles for a consistent urban form. Um, so these chapters or these sections mirror each other where, as in this section, uh, we, we get a little bit more deep and start recommending um, appropriate types of, um, of those design standards. So the first, again, is uh, the frontage type. And as we state in the plan, the it's, it's the most important to shape of uh, the public realm and how buildings are placed on private property in relation to the street. Um, we say that frontages should be scaled appropriately to their location in more urban and suburban style settings and more dense urban parts of Frederick frontages should focus on pedestrian and transit accommodations, attractive street walls and concealed parking options and less dense areas of the city a more suburban uh, scale design can be more appropriate while still accommodating anticipated uh, pedestrian and transit needs. In the plan, uh, we have uh, these three diagrams, and I'll see if I can zoom in again. Um, so basically, this this diagram shows uh, your street frontages as they are on private property. So um, as I described earlier, various neighborhoods in the city, you can quickly picture those neighborhoods when you're looking at these buildings um, in relation to their location on private property. Over here, you can see it from how, how they would look from an aerial view or, or a plan view. Um, when, you, when you then get down here, it, it categorizes um, the frontages from what is provided in the public right of way. So there's all different kinds of options. And this, this is just a few options that there are and, and they're, they're pictures that we took from uh, SmartCode. 
Um, so there's many options, and this is this isn't a recommendation from us. This is just showing what's possible in the framework of a form-based code. So when we start thinking about East Frederick or Golden Mile and designing a, a form-based code, some of those options, maybe all of those options may not be appropriate for a form-based code, but we're going to have to think about and determine uh, the appropriate frontages from on the private side or the private property and the public's property. Um, next is the building types. And let me zoom out here. <clears throat> This is really a uh, mass scale height of uh, buildings and to ensure compatibility of new construction, um, we're recommending that new construction should be a similar scale to the adjacent buildings um, within massing and placement. Um, as we said earlier, uh, this also provides a way from you, for you to transition from neighborhoods. So um, downtown might be four or five, six stories. Um, 4th, 5th, 6th Street on Market, Sh Market Street and 4th, 5th, 5th and 6th might be smaller and then you get to the neighborhood above on Market Street above 7th Street and everything starts to get into a suburban feel. Um, so this is a way where you can create your building hierarchy to transition from your more dense urban core out to your suburban neighborhoods to ensure that infill uh, development is compatible when it occurs. The next is streetscape, and just as we discussed earlier, um, these are the amenities that are provided um, in the public right-of-way. Um, form-based codes provide cross-sections that identify um, the various street hierarchy and how they should be developed, either infill or if at a time uh, we resurface or do roadway improvements, how they should be uh, designed in the future. Um, they identify uh, the right, what should be allocated in the right of way for drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists, sidewalks, landscaping, everything that you can per, uh, picture in, in the street uh, scape realm. Um, one important uh, aspect of, yeah, we, we do call it out, of streetscape is block size. Um, block size as I mentioned earlier, determines the walkability of neighborhoods and, and a good uh, indicator of um, how walkable a neighborhood is, is its total the total perimeter of a block. And uh, we call out 1,800 feet. So a block should be 450 feet on four sides or average out to 1,800 feet to provide a good walkable neighborhood. Next is parking. Um, Form-based codes usually require parking to be located within structures on the street, interior to blocks, or behind buildings. Um, many form-based codes um, have no minimum parking requirements and may limit the maximum uh, number of spaces per permitted and allow shared use uh, parking. This, um, we've had these discussions many times with the Planning Commission, um, and I know that uh, parking calculation is frequently modified. Um, so when we develop form-based codes, there might be some leniency or um, alternatives when designing parking. The next is um, public space and gateway uh, standards. Um, <clears throat> this is basically just the community's vision um, and expectations for public spaces. They could be park at, pocket parks, public uh, regional parks, squares, plazas, pathways, etc. Um, and public spaces uh, uh, could even be um, on private property and perceived as uh, public spaces as well if a, if a developer or a investor wants to provide that on their uh, property. In terms of gateways, um, these are um, distinct entryways into the various neighborhoods um, that set it apart. Um, I know that East Frederick uh, Rising right now is working on art in the traffic circle on East Street. That would be considered a gateway. Um, some of our gateways, which um, this ties back into the land use chapters, 
are South Market Street, uh, the Golden Mile, North Market Street, Route 26 may have a gateway, um, East Patrick Street, uh, there may be different gateways. And this is just something for us to think about um, when making improvements to set apart the transition from um, us traveling from each neighborhood into our city. Um, <clears throat> next is the, the landscape standards. Um, Form-based codes use landscapes to highlight and integrate public spaces with private buildings um, rather than uh, separate or isolate land uses such as Euclidean zoning. Um, the landscaping and form-based codes really just to uh, accentuate the, the build environment, not separated or segregated. Um, lastly, yeah, lastly is the architectural standards. Um, they're rarely used in form-based code because it's so prescriptive on the form, the building mass, size, height, et cetera, that um, you don't want to get too regulatory in this and allow um, the, the private property owner, investor, developer, the opportunity to um, create uh, their, their own um, development. Um, but some uh, form-based codes do regulate uh, fenestration, so you may you might you might be required like the Carroll Creek overlay. You might be required certain amount of windows or door placement or um, main entrances in certain points of the building, um, just to um, create that um, walkability and street liveliness. Um, the last portion is the administration of a form-based code. Uh, let me catch up to myself here. And um, the administration of a form-based code, uh, there's so much upfront investment um, into public input and to studies um, that the administration oftentimes is um, through staff level administrative uh, review uh, because it's so prescriptive. However, it can get hybrid where if um, let's say a developer needs a modification from a certain uh, requirement, they could ask from or for approval of that modification from a development review committee, um, which may be staff level or incorporate planning commissioners or elected officials, or they could be required to go straight to the planning commission to get approval of that modification. It's really limitless um, how comfortable our elected officials in the planning commission uh, feel um, they are with the end product and how we administer it. So it's uh, really honestly limitless how you administer this, but uh, the biggest incentive for the development community when buying into this is the administrative approval that they know they can predict if they construct this building that looks like this with parking in the rear with a bench and landscaping and a door here that they can get approval from staff within i'm just going to throw out a number 30 days 45 days um, then that's where you get your buy-in from the private community um, with that that wraps up all of the the text um, and general background of this chapter and um, we're here to answer any questions. Arash is here as well. Um, this is his expertise, so we're glad to have him here too. So, so Brandon, just one question quick on form-based code, then I do want to go through the roll call. Um, you were talking last about the administration. Mm -hmm. So this will not be part of the code, right? It's not going to be part of the land management code. Is that right? I, I didn't hear you no. say anything uh, about that. This would be extremely similar to conservation districts. It would be approved the same exact way. It would be an overlay district um, based off of a small area plan. So a small area plan would be the first step, right? And then um, with our staff, um, we, we would most likely need to hire an expert. There's a lot of technical... Um, I guess, technical advice we would need in administering a form-based code, not from design and massing and scale, but 
infrastructure requirements when you think about this, because there's so much upfront um, thought into into this code that you want to make sure that if you if you say you can build a four story high commercial building that we have the adequate infrastructure to handle it um whether it's water and sewer and and we just need to be able to estimate our total build out to ensure that that we can handle handle that from a engineering standpoint um so um getting back um to your question uh, that it would it would it would happen very similar to conservation district or HPO where small area plan, form based code, overlay, integrate into the land management code, uh, land you or um, zoning map amendment for that boundary. Let me uh, turn this over then to uh, other commissioners and Commissioner Burns is back on the line. So let's start with you, Commissioner Burns. Yeah, I have about 5% power left, so um, thank you. Uh, Brandon, one, one question, then one comment. A question is, uh, you use the word suburban a lot. Um, what's the range of, of what you define as suburban? From from what level of, of uh, closeness to urban to closeness to rural? I don't know. I think that's a perception. Um, when I discuss suburban, when we discuss suburban, it's mainly through the, the transect, right? The urban to suburban. So what's in between there? I think as a city, we're urban. And for for the most part, um, I think some of like Clover Ridge, um, some of the new 1990s uh, subdivisions, I would classify as suburban. Um, I, th I really think the distinction becomes, is it pedestrian oriented and can you get, um, can you meet your needs through um, like a pedestrian shed um, off the cuff? That's what I, I would consider suburban. Okay, so even your discussion is form based as opposed to density based. Um, my comment is this, um, I, I'm very excited about this in this chapter. This, the, this to me is the heart of the plan and um I, I i even think uh i even think the uh the, the uh moving towards a more administrative level of approval on these these form based things are um is the right direction to go uh, so long as the as the planning commission would have uh, some more level of input in the small area and the corridor plans um i think this is highly technical as you suggest so i i'm I think it's good to delegate it to the expert, uh, at least from my perspective. But um, you know, it's at some. I thought maybe in the um, urban design we would talk a little more about a bit about parking and drop-off areas and how Market Street might look like or Patrick Street. But um, at some point, somewhere in the plan, we need to deal with parking. I mentioned this under transportation, and I didn't get any warm and fuzzies that that parking was going to be um, uh, central. It's got to be. It doesn't have to be its own chapter, but it's got to be covered somewhere. Um, but I, I do like. I do uh, now. Uh, I think the work thus far has been superb, um, and I think you've got some. You know, you're being a good leader, and I think you've got some good staff doing good work. So um, I'm very pleased with everything. It's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I will say that since we had that transportation discussion and parking was brought up um, several times um, from you and other commissioners, we did add a, a rather large parking section and broaden that discussion. That hasn't been presented to you since that first discussion. Good to hear. Good to hear. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Commissioner Manalis. Commissioner Manalis. Um, I do have questions about parking and form-based code. Um, I think similar to Ron, I was just wondering how, um, in terms of parking, how the areas that have limited parking would be enhanced and the ones that have parking facing um, the street, how would that work? The front streets, like for example, off of like, I guess the Golden Mile, West Patrick Street, some of the structures, the parking lots are facing the street. like. What are the plans? Are you 
coexisting structures. And for example, downtown, where at times there's limited parking, is there a way that you got you plan to enhance that using this code? That was one of my questions for that section. Yeah, so um, basically any surface parking lot to go to the Golden Mile, any surface parking lot is really an opportunity for redevelopment uh, when it comes to form-based code. Um, we don't know, and this is a parking discussion in the transportation chapter, we don't know, really know how technology is going to evolve in the next 10, 20 years and how much parking we are going to need. Um, so I, I personally think that we're going to need less um, parking. Um, so, and I, I hope that the, the commercial industries realize that too and view their excess parking as dollar signs and reinvestment opportunities. Um, so some of the form-based code might be prescriptive as the Golden Mile Small Area Plan shows um, that interior road and where their surface parking lot now, you create those building envelopes in those surface lots with on-street or on private street parking. Um, as far as downtown, um, the city's going through the circulation uh, study now, so hopefully we get a lot of information from that. Um, but I really view parking downtown as a, a public amenity and something that the city should provide through its garages or circulate circulators, et cetera. Um, that's the most valuable land we have as a city, so we should develop it at the most intense, at, at the highest intensity we can. Um, parking is not uh, econ as economical as square footage for a commercial or multi uh, or, or mixed use building. Um, mm -hmm. So we should allow those property owners to um, capitalize on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, my other questions go back to the beginning of the chapter. Um, I think the very first one is, I know that we just had a, just looking at my notes, a um, 2020 comprehensive plan questionnaire um, in terms of getting feedback from the residents. And I was just wondering, and I couldn't remember if there was any feedback to community character um, at all. I thought there was, but I wasn't, I couldn't remember. Um, and if there is, um, could we possibly include that information? Um, basically, you know, X percentage of, you know, city residents say or believe blah, 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 come, you know, related to community character and stuff like that. I thought that would have been, um, that's, that would be helpful. Um, I, um, in that, and I was talking about the overview section, sorry. Yep. Um, also, also in the overview, that last sentence, um, and I guess it's a question, um, the last sentence where you say, while eliminating the causes of sprawl, are we already working our way towards that? Or uh, I was just wondering about that section, you know, eliminating the causes of sprawl. And then when I think about sprawl, I think about, you know, um, unmanaged growth. And I was just thinking, you know, in terms of, you know, community character, are we already not working on that? Or is this, I just wanted to get clarification on that piece. That's a really good question. And I don't know if I can answer it right off the top of my head, but, <laughs> but you're right. Uh, unmanaged growth, urban sprawl, urban sprawl is also the quality of development as well. So if, if we can develop not leapfrogging into the county, right? It's It's got to be um, the boundary. If we annex, it has to be connected to the city and contiguous to our current city boundary. I wouldn't consider new development or annexation sprawl, but the perception of that development and the quality of that development could have the, the sprawl characteristics or a new urban center that's necessary to provide new services for those communities that are already in that part of, of the city. Um, so I, that's really where the small area planning process um, is heading, is to tackle each area of our city and determine what needs are, are in each quadrant of our city or in each small area of our city, and then design um, those neighborhoods um, through form-based codes to, to provide those services at 
at at a rate that we can service. That's a really good answer. I agree. Um, my other question was around, I guess, Frederick's identity. So I liked both the title and the contents within that section. Um, but I was wondering, um, the title, in my opinion, the title didn't seem to match the content. The content was more along the lines of how throughout time from 1745 to the present, how the city has evolved over time. And Frederick's identity, I thought spoke, spoke more to values. And I was just wondering if that um, area was um, titled correctly and um, if not what that title would be but then it also piqued my interest when you said Frederick's identity because I thought to myself okay so um, this information provides us of who we were not who we were but provides us a history of the city and so with Frederick's identity I'm thinking to myself you know who are we now and who do we want to become and what does that and that identity should transcend time no matter because it's something that stays like for example you know i you know over 10 years 15 years i am a different person where there's some core values that i had that never change and so with the city of frederick's identity i was just um wondering uh, if you know a section could be included in that but speak to it as well yeah great point um, we'll read through and make sure that the contents match the title or we retitle this section and create the identity um, section. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, my third comment is threats to the community character. Um, so obviously I'm no planner, <laughs> but I was wondering, um, so I saw threats to community character and I was thinking to myself, these things that are mentioned under here, are, are they really threats or are they things that, that growing cities face um, from time to time? Because when I think about threat to community character, I'm thinking about homelessness and homelessness, crime, disease, you know, um, uh, a slowing economy. So I wasn't sure if these things listed below were the word threats was should be used or um, if these things are faced um, by other cities. Some so I guess I would answer that in um, the threats that you mentioned are more um, social threats um, um, where this chapter is um, drafted around um, the the character of our form, the city's uh, okay. environment. Um, we don't con we're not concentrating on the the social threats here. I'd okay. say th that the housing um, gets into that. Now, a lot of this, um, every you know, planning so diverse, everything um, hopefully creates a better social environment for our residents. Um, but um, this was more um, care our, our built environment, the character of our built environment, not social, okay. social aspects. Okay. okay. And that was it. That was all my questions at least for this section. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell here. Um, what great questions you all have been asking, uh, and, and Commissioner Manalis particularly, um, th those are really fantastic observations. You actually used a word, you said ev evolution, or the, that you have evolved. So maybe, maybe the word is evolution instead of identity, but um, I thought that those were really important um, points. Uh, I did want to ask about We've talked about the form-based code, and we've been moving in this direction for some time. And uh, Brandon, you, you did a really good job of explaining what the benefits of form-based code are to developers, builders, um, people that want to come in and, and change the environment. 
can you give me a little feedback on the benefit to the existing community and the existing residents, uh, what form base code means for them? Sure. Um, so basically it's the predictability of uh, future development. So there's so much upfront um, visioning needed to create a form based code that's bought in by our public, our elected officials, planning commissioners, staff, that there should be no questions when someone proposes a new development, what's going to happen? And we all, we should know that this, this building is going to have an FAR of X, Y, and Z. It's going to be this high. It's going to have um, pedestrian access from this side and this side. The parking is going to be here. It's going to be set back from the street here. And there's going to be this type of sidewalk with these amenities and this landscaping. Um, there's no questions um, if we get to this point um, what our future is going to look like. Um, so I would say the benefit to the community is the predictability, really, and the opportunity uh, for them to voice um, their their visions uh, to us um, when we when we're presenting this as an option. So at a at a neighborhood level, one could say, you know, if you moved into a neighborhood that looks a certain way, you you need not fear that you're going to end up with. Uh, a, a, you know, a home next to you that is twice as big, twice as tall, and takes up twice as much of the yard. Where the, the form is going to retain the character of that neighborhood. Is that fair to say? I would say that's fair to say. However, form-based codes really concentrate on commercial corridors, okay. um, non-residential buildings, um, new residential neighbor uh, development, um, and mixed-use buildings. So. Let's just say your neighbor subdivides. Um, uh, it has a, do a, a lot that's he's able to he or she is able to subdivide. Um, hopefully, the form based code is prescriptive enough that says um, here's your building envelope. But it could it might be you know whatever's determined. It could be two to four stories with a setback of you know a, a maximum setback of five feet or ten feet. Um, so there's more predictability with it, but I would say form-based code, um, it, it, its main benefits are for non-residential or new residential infill development. Okay, so, so as a follow-up to that, I guess, you know, we were talking about different tools to preserve neighborhoods, and we have the HPO, we're talking about conservation districts. Um, it sounds like a conservation district is probably the best tool for a neighborhood to retain its character okay I would agree with that. Yes. okay and I'm I'm very <laughs> can't imagine how excited I am um, about you know moving this concept forward um, uh, and historic preservation overlay in the right place is absolutely the right thing but there are many many neighborhoods outside of those really significant areas that um, are are valuable in, in the, with their context that need to be protected. So I think this is really important. I'm very excited about looking um, at, at how, how that's going to all um, come to bear. Um, I did want to just ask sort of a, go back and do a basic 101 question, not so much for us, but for uh, members of the listening public. We talk a lot about Euclidean zoning and a lot of people don't understand what that is or why it's called Euclidean. I, I know that when I first started doing this, I thought it had to do with math. Um, so maybe if you could just sort of give an overview to the listening public about what Euclidean zoning is and is not. <laughs> sure. You're putting me on the hot seat here from uh, Planning 101. Um, so <laughs> uh, Euclidean zoning is basically the allocation of various zoning districts um, to determine their density and intensity for uh, residential zoning districts. Typically, you'll see like R2, R4, R6, R8, R20. Um, that gives you uh, the idea of how dense that uh, zone uh, could be developed for uh, non-residential areas. You might see general commercial, neighborhood commercial, industrial, um, and various other types of non-residential uses. And this, and this is basically, the intensity of that is basically um, based on 
uh, square footage and um, infrastructure needs. Um, Euclidean zoning was created during the industrialization of um, our country where we had to separate uh, land uses for uh, safety, welfare, environmental concerns um, for our countries when we didn't have as strict environmental laws back then. Does that answer it? I think you're muted. I will give you an A, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, My professor would probably give me a C minus. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty pretty good. <laughs> um, I, I just think it's important, that, you know, especially in residential areas, people are like, you know, four units per acre, six units per acre, and what does that really mean? And so it's it's a it's a very it's a very interesting concept. Um, doesn't always work. The other thing I just wanted to mention, we, we, were, we were all talking about sprawl and annexations and new development and that that, you know, if the city chooses to, um, or if, the, if, if actually a property owner chooses or wants to come into the city and wants to be annexed, because that's that's how we do it. We, we don't go out and grab and, and pull land in. We uh, annex land when landowners are asked to be part of the city. We um, you know, we we get certain uh, benefits out of that that we that we negotiate, but I think it's a very important point that you made about you know development occurring in the city. Um, we really want to we what we want to do is set up the city of Frederick to be the the recipient of new development, infill development, and and not have it s spread out you know into. Uh, into the county, into farmlands, into land that we want to preserve. So this whole concept of um, predictability and um, preservation and infill, all of these things are, are good things that are tools that direct the, the growth into the city of Frederick, which in turn benefits not only the city, but the county and the state. We all benefit from the development occurring in the city. I just thought that was a really um, salient point that I wanted to emphasize. Thank you. I think that's all we have for now. Uh, this is Joe Adkins. I'm um, just speaking, just a few observations. Um, the first one is, is that, you know, dealing with the small area plans, which is the basis for form based codes and dealing with um, the conservation districts, you know, all this will go, you know, start at staff level, go through the planning commission, and then ultimately the mayor and board have the final say on all three of those subject matters. So, um, and as Brandon mentioned before, you know, especially with the uh, form based code, you know, going through the small area plan, you know, the amount of public, if we don't get public input, it's it's going to fail. And so we, we need to get the public input. And so, once when we go down that path, you know, staff will be striving to get that public input and to make sure everyone understands what's going on. And then getting back to what Dorothy was saying about parking was that, you know, if you would ask me <clears throat> four months ago if I if the planning department could get by with no one being in the office for the last 10 weeks, 11 weeks, I would have said, no, it, it, you know, we need people here. I've been the only one here, you know, every day of the week by my own choosing. Um, I could have been at home myself, but um, I, I think the way that we're going to be looking at office space, I mean, you know, if you look at Twitter, they just said that their employees never have to come back to the office again. Um, and I think, you know, parking is going to be our office space and then the office space is going to be reimagined. And once when you do that, parking is going to be reimagined as well. So I think, you know, dealing with parking and office space, I think, you know, I don't want to say the new normal, but when we get to the end of this and whatever we look like, you know, whatever that normal uh, pattern is that we uh, come out into, uh, I think it's going to have a lot to do with how we visualize how we work and how we um, move around. I mean, if you look at Uber, you know, they, they're, they're the number of trips that they have uh, are, are providing is down by like 80 percent and you know if you look at amazon their sales are probably up by 80 percent would be my guess so i, I think parking and office space are going to have a, a big impact on how we look at the city and I, I think once when we get through this and through the comprehensive plan we'll have a better understanding of it all 
Thanks, Joe. That was really helpful. Um, so for me, this chapter was, I was really looking forward to this, this chapter the most, and it was really a pleasure to read through it. The Planning Commission over the past couple of years has struggled with um, a couple of situations, and the staff was saying what, what we need is a comprehensive approach. Um, and it was very clear that we needed some more tools to effectively work with some of these situations. So um, in reading through this and having you all answer our questions to how this framework can be those tools to help get us to a place that we can effectively deal is that me reverberating back? Okay, with the situation, um, I'm, I am thrilled about that. My, my one question, uh, one remaining question um, is, is how did you choose, like why did you choose the conservation district? There are many, many things, and without going through the whole litany of everything, um, why did you land on this and why did you think this was our best tool? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't know, um, you know, Christina and Arash uh, played a, a big role in, in drafting this um, chapter and Christina and I, um, when we laid out the framework, um, we just went through and I don't even think there was discussion on other options i felt i think it's just one of those things where you you have a feeling and you that it's the right tool um and and with our success with the hpo um i think that uh us as a city is very are, are very capable of implementing a conservation district um very fairly because of the experts we have on staff um christina and lisa um, and equitably uh, for our public. Um, this is no doubt gonna be something that we're gonna get a lot of feedback from, um, both spectrums. Um, the important part of that is knowing that staff is very fair and equitable when they review and that the conservation district isn't to be another regulatory tool, tool that holds up uh, household improvements um, or or replacement of, of architectural features on your on your house. It's mainly there to ensure that property values are are preserved and enhanced, and that new development and additions are are compatible with the the neighborhood. I don't know of any other tool that would be so fair uh, to the public, um, and and not. And when I say regulatory, a, a new regulation that would be so um, flexible um, in, in, in allowing uh, investment on, in, on private property and, and reconstruction of um, or additions to existing dwellings. Um, I don't know if Christina wants to jump in. Um, she is our expert on the conservation districts, but um, I, I always felt that conservation districts were was the only option and, and the right choice. Yeah, I, I think Brandon answered that very well. Um, so thanks for those comments. The only thing I will add that is um, um, I scoured different tools and overlays that could be potentially be used uh, to address community character. And I really didn't find anything that um, could, could address the issues that Frederick is facing other than neighborhood conservation uh, districts that to incorporate into our existing toolkit. Thank you. Uh, before we go on to the policies, oh, I was Madam going Chair. to say what other, yeah, questions. Yeah, Alderman Russell here. I just wanted to comment that, that the concept of conservation districts in the city of Frederick has been discussed uh, by staff and by neighborhoods for over a decade um, since a particular neighborhood tried to get a historic preservation overlay 
um, there was a lot of discussion and research starting back then um, about what would work well for the city of Frederick. So I have every confidence that it's not just that it feels right and it looks like the right tool, but the fact that it has been uh, researched and evaluated over at least the last 10 years as you know what we can do in addition to historic preservation um, to preserve our neighborhoods. I'm, I'm very confident that staff has done a really deep dive into this and has um, made a great recommendation. Great, that is good to know. I was not aware of that. Uh, other commissioners, any other, uh, let's say Commissioner Burns, any other comments or questions? Commissioner Manalis, any other comments or questions? Commissioner Manalis, no other questions or comments. Well, that was very thorough and thank you. Um, I think it was an hour and a half well spent. So Brandon, the floor is yours then. All right, thank you. I'll share my uh, screen um, on our policies. I would like to note that um, when you're, and this may be a good time for me to ask feedback on this as well. Um, when you're looking at your PDF of the laid out version, you only see the main policies. Um, so if you look, uh, here, let me share. I apologize. I'm going to delay our discussion just a tad bit to get some feedback here. Um, let me share my screen. So, so the layout um, only has the main policies. And um, we changed this from previous plans, and we were going to ask for feedback when we got to the implementation chapter, but I just wanted to show you guys this now for clarification. Um, just to reduce redundancy in the plan, um, for the main chapters, we are only showing the main policies without the implementation measures. Um, when you get to the implementation section, it goes through the main policies with all the implementation me measures as well as the priority on um, the responsible parties, um, how it ties into the mayor's strategic plan, et cetera. Um, if you guys feel that it's important to have the implementation measures in each chapter, it's an easy uh, revision so we can throw them back in. Um, but we thought um, to reduce redundancy in the plan, you could we, we would show the, the main policies in each chapter and then um, go to, when you go to the implementation, chapter um, you would see the other measures. Um, I will now share my screen to go to the implementation of this chapter. So Brandon, a really quick question as you are um, transitioning. Are we going to discuss tonight the implementation points of the policies or do you also want to um, have the discussion of the implementation points at during the implementation chapter sure i anticipate we do this we would do this chapter like we do we did all the rest of the chapters and um we provided in the planning commission version of the word document all the policies with the implementation measures which i'm sharing uh, right now um so it's here we might as well go through it right great okay so policy one is define area planning sectors in order to identify, preserve, and promote existing neighborhood physical characteristics. The implementation measures for that are establish small area plans to provide specific development guidance for the adoption of form-based codes, establish objectives for each uh, sector to focus on placemaking through the built environment of flexibility to accommodate many land uses, this includes identify the physical built and natural characteristics and qualities to define the existing sections of the city that should be retained uh, and used to enhance new development, encourage compatible design standards and uses in neighborhoods to establish visual diversity and community that complements the neighborhood's character and needs. Lastly, design public roadways and uh, right of ways for efficient, comfortable experience for all users and modes while balancing operational and ma maintenance expenses. Um, I should note that all these policies basically give the framework to establish conservation districts or form based codes. So it's basically just a step by step step um, on how we would implement 
uh, those two measures with some other policies in there that we can use when reviewing development review applications or making other decisions. Um, policy two, support oh, creating. Yes. And then we had said that we would talk about each policy oh, separately. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, when we talked earlier today. Um, Commissioner Burns is not on the line. I do not see him in the meeting. So uh, we will go to Commissioner Manalis. Uh, Commissioner Manalis, no comments at this time. Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell, nothing at this time. Okay, Commissioner Nicholas. My, um, my question was, should we not be more descriptive as to where we see these small area plans being developed? Um, seems, and this is what I had written in, in the Google document. Seems that they are not appropriate for all areas, so more definition of where we see them being and or what the characteristics of areas that lend themselves to the development of small area plans would be helpful. Okay, so um, I believe in the land use section, we established the various small area plan, uh, or we delineated the areas for future small area plans. Um, I believe the intent with form-based code is to tackle each area with a small area plan that is then implemented through the creation of a form-based code and hopefully a, a nonprofit such as East Frederick Rising or Golden Mile Alliance that helps uh, implement the goals and visions of that plan. So. Um, one of the strategic uh, plan, mayor strategic plan goals was to have a small area plan that encompassed or small areas plans that encompass the entire city. So the land use chapter uh, extended the boundaries so that the entire city is is covered with a small area plan. Okay. That being said, um, small area plans generally concentrate on commercial corridors and form-based codes generally concentrate on non-residential areas. Okay, I think you just actually answered my question, but the last sentence you said, so I, I am taking away from your answer, even though the East Frederick Rising and the Golden Mile are the small area plans that the city's focusing on in the near term, ultimately the goal is to have the whole city have some, every part of the city will be included in some small area plan. That's correct. Okay, even though the last thing you said, but it sounded like the residential areas were not necessarily included in these yet since every part of the city will be in a small area plan they will be i'll rephrase that to say that there there's not as much impact on the residential areas because they're built out um and you're not we're not anticipating much redevelopment of those areas um there are um considerations to the street network and connections from uh, the existing established residential neighborhoods to commercial corridors or non-residential areas. Okay, well, thank you. Yep. That's it for me. Policy two. Support creative site planning and high quality architecture in order to establish a built environment that is compatible and enhances neighborhood character aesthetics and offers various levels of interaction to all members of the community while allowing for innovative design. One, encourage mix, a mix of uses to integrate work and living spaces with a combination of diverse housing and commercial styles and densities within neighborhood contexts. Encourage infill of vacant and underutilized property in and around the core city center or center city. Review proposals for infill development to ensure compatible architecture and site planning. Encourage construction to meet basic levels of sustainability and wellness certification. Encourage the location of new commercial and, and or residential buildings adjacent to the right of way to give definition to the street where appropriate. Encourage new development to incorporate elements where people can gather to interact 
and interact to help foster a sense of community. Six, ensure the placement of residential development, commercial buildings, parking, access, and landscaping is complementary to neighborhood characteristics in the immediate vicinity. Seven, ensure that the building uh, or the design of buildings and their features protect the view sheds of the clusters, fires, Catoctin Mountains, historic resource, and existing neighborhoods. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so we'll do a roll call again of the commissioners for questions, comments. Uh, still looks like Commissioner Burns is not with us, so Commissioner Manalis. Commissioner Manalis, um, I like the second policy. I was just wondering, um, I noticed all the um, verbs um, from one through six. Um, are in, is in cap is encourage, and I was just wondering how would that be, would that be implemented? How would you encourage that? Some how would you encourage some of these implementations? So like, that's a good question. Um, it's a tough question. Um, I think for two, we can do any everything we can to encourage and fill vacant or underutilized properties, um, perhaps develop incentives, et cetera, but we can't uh, force the hand of these property owners to do that. Um, same with three. Um, this is a slight deviation from the 2010 language where it said en encourage construction to be LEED certified. There's Since 2010, there's so many different certificates or or of sustainability and wellness that um, it just didn't seem right to call out lead. Um, so encourage either by some sort of incentive, tax uh, incentive, I don't know what, um, to meet these levels of sustainability. But um, it is a good thing to, to construct to that, um, but is it necessary uh, for community character? It's, it's good will and intent, but is it necessary? Um, I think there's things we could do to encourage that, um, such as maybe having a staff um, certified in one of these so the developers get extra points if we review that. Um, mm -hmm. I think from us for, for staff on many of these, th these are developer driven, um, I guess, improvements. Uh, the last one is ensure we certainly have or number right. seven is ensure we, we certainly have uh, a role to play in preserving those view sheds. I hope that answers. That was a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> it does answer, and I guess maybe some type of policy, maybe policy may play a part in this as well. I don't know. But I thought that um, policy number two was um, good. Um, um, and number three, I think it's a typo. It's an extra Oh, yes, I realized that when I was reading it. Thank you. Yep. Fight the good fight for policy two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell here. Um, so a couple of things in the policy you talk about offering various levels of interaction to all members of the community. And I would suggest that we, we say interaction and and maybe mobility. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with people's ability to get around. Um, and so interaction, just not interface, but getting here to there. Okay. Just, just a thought about that. Um, what, a couple of, of definition questions, I guess. One is we, we have clustered spires as a capitalized thing. Um, and we all kind of know what it is, but it's not really a thing thing. So, you know, is do we need to define what it is we're talking about? The, the view shed of the steeples downtown, or not everybody's going to know what the clustered spires is, and it's not really a designated thing. Okay. Same same question. Back to number two, um, in and around the core center city, what's that? Yeah, I knew that was going to be a question. <laughs> when I was reading it. Um, because we should encourage uh, infill uh, development and vacant underutilized property all around the city. So mm -hmm. 
Um, I think that's a great point. And when I re was reading that just tonight, um, I was like, man, we should change that. So um, we'll so definitely pass, pass spend some time. That's, that's all I have there. Thank you. Okay. And Commissioner Nicholas, I actually have no questions on this. I think it's uh, a very good policy. Okay. Policy three, encourage the implementation of complete street objectives in all areas of the city. Encour one, encourage residential streets that are interconnected and provide for safe travel, travel for all users in all of all modes. Encourage amenities in all neighborhoods that allow for a sense of place for pedestrians as part of any street. Okay, Commissioner Manalis. Commissioner Manalis, I don't think I have any comments about um, policy three, though I am looking at number one right now, and I'm just wondering. Um, Um, encouraging residential streets that are interconnected. We currently have streets that are not interconnected. So uh, is this speaking to uh, new development or, or is this talking about existing? Like, I'm not sure. I would say it's a policy um, mainly intended for infill development and um, new master plan communities. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell here. Um, so we have the, the, we have adopted a complete streets policy. We have, uh, oh, there's a cat in the background. Um, we have uh, been working on standard city details that implement that complete streets policy. So I want us, I think it's important that we be emphatic about this. This is not something that we encourage. This is something that we require. Complete streets are um, the way we have to go in the future. And so I would suggest that we're more emphatic there that rather than just saying encourage residential streets, we, we want all streets to be interconnected as moving forward, uh, be they, you know, commercial mixed use etc. Um, and then I think be more emphatic in policy too about, you know, again, amenities in all neighborhoods that not only allow for a sense of place, but that um, provide a sense of equity and mobility um, for everyone. Okay. I think those are uh, excellent comments. And um, I'm smiling here because on this one, on uh, implementation number one under here, when I was going through this on Sunday, this is where the word encouraged, I got stopped. And I just, I kept coming back to it. And I did that exercise of writing down words and require was the one I actually circled. And it sounded like that is um, exactly what we heard Alderman Russell say. So, um, and I, I think Alderman Russell really expounded upon this in an excellent way that underscored why encourage is not strong enough. Got it. Um, okay, uh, so I guess policy four. Okay. Design light industrial areas to complement the community's image and the visual aesthetics of adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, one, encourage the integration of light industrial type uses that have experienced technological advancements to be less disturbing or to be s less such disturbing to locate in areas that complement the neighborhood uses. Um, require the use of building materials that minimize visual contrast between the structure and surrounding neighborhoods. Promote four-sided architecture with appropriate landscape buffering in industrial areas. Promote the use of energy efficient construction materials in industrial areas. Okay, comments and questions. Uh, Commissioner Manalis. 
commission of analysis number three. Um, I was just curious as why the word promote was chosen um, um, for number three. Good question. Um, this is a carryover from 2010. Um, promote was used in 2010 plan. I did change from four-sided architecture with extensive landscape buffer to appropriate landscape buffer. Mm -hmm. um, so if you guys feel that there's a, a word that's more appropriate, then um, we can revise that. Okay, that was my only question. Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell here. Um, so we talk about light industrial areas, which sort of alludes back to Euclidean zoning. Um, so what kind of what kind of areas are we really talking about here? Is it and that and also number one the sentence doesn't make any sense to me i'm sorry there's some extra words in there or missing words um but so uh, as an example when we talk about um you know we currently have uh, an area that's owned light industrial and we have a use that comes in that does electronics parts manufacturing and that um, is really uh, you know unobtrusive to the surrounding areas um I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're alluding to um, a zoning classification if we're thinking about moving more to the form-based code in these kinds of areas. Does that make sense? Y your question makes sense, yes. Um, so what I, how I think this was drafted, and I believe there are some revisions to it that do not make sense, and I agree with you. Um, was to allow um, uses that we perceive or classify as light industrial now um, that are no longer light industrial um, because they no longer have the negative impacts that they once had because of technolo technological advances to locate in other areas of the city that are compatible that we once said they weren't. Um, so this is getting to allowing more mixture of uses between commercial and industrial in areas of the city that maybe we once viewed as strictly general commercial. Um, uh, so the, the, you, you allow the adaptive reuse of maybe commercial buildings that are no longer viable for retail for manufacturing or other type of mix, mixture of uses that were not permitted 10, 20 years ago. And that's exactly the, what I wanted to say. What you just said there makes much more sense than what I'm reading here. Um, so I don't know if it's just you know vernacular, or, um, yeah. but the concept is there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We will fix that. Thank you. And Commissioner Nicholas here, implementation number one. I think when I was reading it through. Um, uh, I, I couldn't make sense of uh, that first sentence either with or without the word such. I think I suggested taking the word such out, but I'm, I wasn't even sure what it was trying to say. So um, less such disturbing, but it sounds like we just had a conversation and you're going to reword that entire. I will reword I it. I will reword it. I'm pretty sure it got revised and I probably accepted it without reading it much. And um, I Something happened there, uh, but I take blame. Something happened there. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. There's no blame. This is a draft. Exactly. And, and in the Google Docs, it's like everybody's got their hands in the, in the mixing bowl. All right. All right. Five. Uh, the city's capital improvement projects shall make a positive contribution to the city's character. Um, one, ensure the city buildings and community facilities con contribute to neighborhoods with appropriate site design and quality architecture. Two, incorporate the comprehensive bicycle plan into the design and construction phase of applicable capital improvement plans. Okay. Commissioner Manalis, comments, questions? No question or comment. 
Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell. Um, I agree that they, sh they shall make a positive contribution. I, I feel that there's something missing here, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm going to have to think about that a little bit more. I mean, our capital improvement projects, you know, could be, they could be a, a bridge, they could be a building, they could be a park, they could be a sewer treatment plant. Um, I'm not sure how some of those I need to think about this one a little bit more. I feel like there's some substance missing. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll give you more when it comes to me. So, um, Commissioner Nicholas, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm going ditto, 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 but um, when I read the implementation the other day and tonight, it feels like I, it just doesn't feel like there is an implementation plan. And um, number two makes total sense. And number one, ensure the city buildings and community facilities contribute to neighborhoods. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how number one really ties back into the city's capital improvement project. So this doesn't seem cohesive to me. I like the policy, but it's missing a lot for me with the implementation. Okay. So just to follow up, what, so what was the intention here? What were we trying to say? That, that would be helpful. Sure. So the policy is a carryover from 2010, but the implementation um, has changed slightly. The, the goal was to, I guess, walk the walk uh, for city projects. Um, if we're requiring the public sector or the private sector to invest in, in their developments and to um, construct a certain way that if we're going to construct, I don't know, a, a pump station in the middle of a neighborhood that we should at least do something um, so that it's compatible with that neighborhood. Or if we are going to solicit funding to reconstruct a bridge that right now is only two travel lanes that we provide um, sidewalks or a bike lane in that budget um, to provide uh, amenities for the community so that um, I guess when the planning commission reviews it, and it's it's something for us um, to go back in the development review process and be like, well, hey, w we require uh, the development sector, um, the developers to do this. We should be doing it too. Um, there's always budget constraints, et cetera, um, just like there is in the private sector. So um, it's just something for us to use when reviewing um, development review applications where we are the applicant. Yes, I like that. <laughs> put, we can beat that. that up a little bit. There you go. Okay. Six. Policy six, yep. Promote the rehabilitation of blighted, vacant, or underutilized structures and parcels within city limits to reinforce the unique character of existing community buildings where appropriate. Implementation one, encourage rehabilitation rather than demolition of existing structures. Two, expand grant and tax credit opportunities for facade improvements throughout the city. Three, identify areas of the land management code or other city policies that may prevent rehabilitation or reuse of buildings based on nonconformities or conflicts within the code. Four, promote architectural salvage or deconstruction in place of outright demolition where appropriate. Five, encourage the development of vacant or underutilized lots. Okay, uh, Commissioner Manalis, comments or questions? Commissioner Manalis, um, just comments. The same comments I had for policy two um, would apply to policy six. Um, I really liked policy six, it resonated with me. Um, I was just wondering, of course, as I mentioned before in policy two, how number one, um, number four, and number five implementations would be 
um, um, how encourage how how you would go about encouraging um, the implementation of those policies one four and five and that was my only comment. Alderman Russell. Thank you. Alderman Russell here. Um, this is so, so, so critically important. Um, and uh, as Commissioner Manala said, you know, we use the words encourage, promote, um, and I don't want to regulate necessarily, but I think that we need to make sure that our encouragement and promotion are as um, strong as possible. Um, and the promotion of architectural salvage and, and or deconstruction in place of outright demolition, just that I think that's a fantastic implementation um, of this policy. But again, you know, I guess the, the, the devil is, you know, what does encourage mean? And, and those are things that I suppose are going to fall to, you know, legislative um, things like tax credits or regulatory schemes or whatever. Um, but this has been, this particular issue is of vital importance to the community character. And we've seen, you know, that the uh, Historic Preservation uh, Review, the Demolition Review Ordinance came out of some of these situations. And so whatever we can do to um, assertively protect these resources um, in, in strong language, I would I would uh, like to see that. Okay. To build on that, um, and in listening to the comments, of Commissioner Manalis and Alderman Russell. Number five, encourage the development of vacant or underutilized lots. There have been a number of um, changes to land management code, specifically to allow for this. And um, so in this case, for number five, um, I would put some more be meat on the bones that will sort of um, lay the groundwork and point to that kind of effort. Um, so looking at what's in place now, what's in the code, what's, what is preventing um, th that development of the vacant or the underutilized lots. And we certainly have seen some of this and we've heard from some owners and developers of some of the issues that they've they've had specifically in the downtown core. So um, that is the one, um, and I do love this too. I, I love all of them, but I think number five needs a little more um, direction. So um, that will spur specific action. Commissioner Nicholas, if I can just jump in one, with one more comment as I'm looking at this. Um, in the policy itself, it talks about reinforcing the unique character of existing community buildings. Um, what, is, what do we mean by community buildings, and do we just mean existing structures or, or something like that? Yeah, I think it's existing structures. Okay. Thank you. Yep. That's, a, that's an excellent comment. Very good comment. Okay, I think we're on to the... No, we have two more policies. So, Madam Chair, might, I'm sorry, might, might it be an opportunity to, to put the numbers back up on the screen to let people know when, because we're getting down to the, sort yes. of the yep. public comment. Thank yep. you. I, I was going to do that right before we took the last set of comments. But, um, all right. So, so is anybody calling in? Should we also say it? Or... Is anybody just seeing it on YouTube? Everyone should be seeing this on YouTube right now. Okay, I, I would I would suggest that we say it because not everybody can see it. Well, that that was what my question was. Okay, thank you. Um, so the call-in number is nine two nine two two nine five six six nine, 
and the conference ID is 2400426161 pound. Okay, so I'll leave that up. Um, so policy seven is explore the creation of neighborhood conservation district overlay zones to protect and enhance existing residential neighborhood characteristics. Um, one, determine where conservation district overlay zones may be appropriate in the city. Two, survey and assess areas of the city that may be eligible for conservation district overlay zones. Three, form the creation of one or more task force or committees to generate neighborhood conservation overlay design guidelines. Okay, Commissioner Manalis. Commissioner Manalis, I only had um, one question and that was for number three. Um, and I was just curious about like, what do you envision there? Um, when you say task force or committees, is that comprise of citizens, experts? What are you, what are you talking about in that section? Thank you. I would say um, all the above, but I'm going to ask Christina to jump in because she has experience um, forming these task force for other areas of historic preservation. Uh, thanks, Brendan. I, I, let me get you back on camera. There you go. Um, I would envision that we would probably treat the creation of design guidelines similarly how we created or updated our guidelines for the um, the downtown historic district, uh, relying on um, uh, city staff with lots of public outreach and education and feedback from um, the public uh, through various meetings and um, discussions. Christina, do you think that, you, that it would be appropriate to incorporate commission members, the public, uh, Historic Preservation Commission members or interested parties like that um, when you create these groups? Yes, I, I think there's definitely value of um, having a professional in the room to um, provide additional guidance and, and feedback. Yeah. Thank you. That was helpful. Okay, Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell here. Um, I think this looks really good. I think there we've talked a lot about you know public input, the emphasis on community uh, participation in this to make it successful. So I'm wondering if there, there might be an implementation that talks about um, holding community charrettes uh, or community input meetings um, to talk about you know this whole education of what it is and then you know what it might look like for folks. Will do. That's a good point. And it's really, really critically important that this is not something that we do to the community. It's something that we do with the community. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. All right. And uh, Commissioner Nicholas, I'll say, um, so when reviewing this over the weekend, I did make some suggestions on these words, as I believe they at first had either either consider, encourage, and um, I did think it was more emphatic. It, it was important to be more emphatic to move forward with these conservation districts. So I do appreciate that what we are seeing tonight are words that will make that happen. That's it for me. Okay. Last policy for the evening. Encourage and promote quality architecture design, which will better define public, the public realm and which will reinforce Frederick's sense of place. Uh, one, revise current development regulations to support mixed use development and high quality urban design. Two, research the implementation of form-based code in specific corridors or neighborhoods in the city. Commissioner McAllis. No questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Manel. Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell here. Um, I would suggest that we promote high quality architectural design. Um, 
And then in implementation number two, not just research the implementation of form-based code, because we're talking about actual implementation of it in small area planning areas. So let's sort of rework that um, to indicate that that's, that's an implementation is actually creating this form-based code in, in the appropriate areas. Yeah, I agree. That's actually a carryover from 2010 where um, a lot's changed since then. And it might even be appropriate to remove it there because it's in so many other places in this chapter. Um, oh, we have someone calling in. Okay, we're, we're not quite ready, but okay. good. Come on. Alderman Russell, any other comments or questions? Um, I guess I would just say it, it, if that's not a place to include number two, then to have a single policy and a single implementation feels like we're missing a little meat on the bone. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. We will, we will work with this one. Yeah. Great. Present something. Thank you. Commissioner Nichols, that was my exact, I actually uh, comment, I, this was another one. I like the policy, but number one sounds way too general. Um, it's sort of like it paints with a very broad brush. We're going to support mixed-use development and high-quality ur urban design. I, I don't know, again, what actions you take from that. And um, so I, I think this needs a lot of thought to its implementation of a policy. Okay. All right. So with that, actually, um, and the uh, call-in number and conference ID is up. We're going to say it one more time, and then we. it sounds like we have at least one caller uh, in the lobby. So the number is 929-229-5669. Very broad brush. The conference ID is 240-04261 pound. So um, whomever is, is that you, Joe, that do you have somebody there then for us in public comment? Or whomever is organizing this process? Madam Chair, I believe if you just call on them, they're in oh, here. I, you know what, we didn't actually, um, I do apologize. The process is different and I didn't uh, remember that you're exactly right. So uh, there is only one and it is um, the last four digits is 7388. So <clears throat> the floor is yours. I don't know who unmute, unmutes the person, but they are on mute at this time. Well, we figured that out just if you would just remind them to state their name and general address. Thanks. That is correct. And then after that, um, you will be sworn in and then you can give your testimony. I am not sure who, mute, who muted them or if they muted their, themselves. Yeah, they're still showing as muted. Yeah. I know the organizer can mute everybody. And then um, if that, but in these kind of meetings, um, I'm not exactly sure of the process. I'm working on it. Okay. I'm looking at options and we can't unmute. Need one of those screens that says we are currently experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. I cannot mute or unmute this person. Uh, could we ask the person to call back? Do you think that might help? Okay. 
So 7388, if you would hang up and call back, we'll see if we can get a good the person's leaving. <laughs> All right. It Hello, looks like this is Kara. Hey, Karen. Um, uh, so if you would state your full name and your address, and then you will be sworn in. Sure. This is Kara Norman with um, Downtown Frederick Partnership, 19 East Church Street. Okay, Kara. Um, if you'd raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the responses given and statements made in this hearing before the Planning Commission will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, say, I do. I do. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm calling to offer some comment, um, and so um, hopefully this all works, but um, kind of in the preview section related to uh, skyline views and scenic vistas, the text states specifically to limit the overall height throughout downtown Frederick. And I certainly support the idea of, of um, maintaining views to our um, clustered spires. I think that's the primary item of, of concern in that portion of the text. However, there are many places in downtown Frederick where you're unable to see the spires. So I was hopeful that that section could be amended to, the, to reflect where the views are possible. There's a later portion where you talk about implementation steps, um, and it does mention this again. I would certainly welcome one of the implementation steps reflecting the need for a study to identify where views of historic, um, the clustered spires do exist and where they do not exist so that we could reflect that um, in the regulation, but the views are not possible everywhere. Next, on form-based code, this is certainly not to speak um, against that idea. I support the idea of form-based code, but I also want us to be careful of unintentional disincentives. We have purposefully and rightfully so put in a more complex process in downtown Frederick, and I don't want to create a situation where there is a disincentive to develop in downtown Frederick because it, for example, is so much easier on the east side. So I want us to take into account um, those two, uh, the relationship of those two items as these things move forward. Then speaking more to the specific policies that are identified um, within the text, on um, policy one, um, I'm sorry, my volume on my computer just went up. Um, on for, um, part one, on um, policy one, hang on, I got to turn off the volume on my own computer again. Um, that we are, um, the concern there was related to the small area plans and the kind of the comment that one of the commissioners had about who all that applied to. Um, and on the second portion of that, um, it related to, sorry, I can't seem to get my two computers to work at the same time. Um, it related to, uh, I personally focused mostly on the placemaking related aspect of it. And I felt that there were other ideas that could occur that support placemaking that were outside the A through whatever that were listed under part two. And I also wanted to make sure that our placemaking wasn't just focused on the areas doing small area plans. There's a lot more opportunities beyond the small area planning process to achieve um, placemaking. As it related to um, policy two, number two, um, the idea of encouraging infill, um, in, and that we, you had a comment about beyond the core center city, and I totally agree that infill needs extend beyond the core, but I think it's important to note that the intervention in the core is going to be different than the intervention on the Golden Mile as an example, and potentially that that could be reflected. On policy three, I certainly support the implementation of complete streets 
But when you go to your preamble, you identify streetscape as being critically important. Um, and I feel like the implementation steps don't go far enough to really an enforce, um, reinforce and implement objectives related to improving our streetscapes, which are definitely need in need of improvement, in particular in downtown, but I'm sure there are other places in the community where that's needed as well. Um, under policy five, I would agree with the commissioner's general statements that I didn't feel like it went far enough. And this is another place where I felt like streetscape could be better addressed. Um, and then under policy six, um, I quite honestly would change the order. We have a lot more underutilized structures than we have blighted structures. And it sort of changes the emphasis of that piece. Um, and when I look at number two and expand grant and tax credit opportunities for facade improvements, I can't speak to the entire city, but I can tell you in downtown Frederick, pre-pandemic, we did a big study of um, what it would take to get more housing in downtown Frederick. And it's very clear that it doesn't make economic sense. And the issues that prevent it from making economic sense extend well beyond facade improvements. So I would like to see this expanded both in terms of the um, portions of the building that are included in terms of incentives as well as the type of incentives. I agree with grants and tax credits. Potentially, there could be others. On three, under this policy six, number three, um, I agree with the idea of looking at the LMC and other city policies that prevent rehabilitation or reuse. My concern is the last portion based on nonconformities or conflicts with the code. This is a place where we should be incentivizing development. I think that our opportunities to look at the LMC and other city policies should extend beyond nonconformities and look at true ways to provide incentives. And um, the last kind of, um, I guess this is more of a general comment, but I missed it up top. I've been writing notes as you guys have been talking. Um, but the whole gateway standards, I think that if I understand correctly, that's all under form-based code, which I appreciate why that's there and think it belongs there. But I wondered, Brandon mentioned South Market Street. I would assume that that would not fall in the East Street planning area, but it is a gateway area that would benefit, benefit greatly from gateway standards. So I'm wondering if there is a way to provide for gateway standards in areas that wouldn't necessarily be covered by a form-based code option um, so that we can address those corridors. I know the county is looking to areas south of there. At least that was their intent pre-pandemic. I don't know if it's still the same. Um, but we want to make sure South Market Street makes sense, especially if the county is looking at areas directly to the south. Um, so overall, I appreciate the chapter and the information in it. I just wanted to see more incentives in place for um, redevelopment, infill, underutilized sites, be they occupied or a vacant site, um, and certainly more emphasis on improving our streetscape. And then last, I just had a question is, at what point or where could you find the graphics that are depicted in what you were showing online tonight? I have the, I'm on the city site. I don't see them there, but um, I also will admit I don't always find everything I should on the city site. So uh, that could be my problem. And that's it. I was trying to hurry. Okay, well, thank you. And Brandon, can you answer her question? Uh, you're on mute still. Got it. So the graphic, the PDF version of the layouts, um, they will be uploaded on the 2020 comp plan progress page where you see the PC version and the red line version. Um, as we finish them, I don't believe that any have been uploaded yet, but we plan on uploading um, them here shortly. Great, thank you. Thank you. Barb, you might be on mute. I am on mute. Sorry about that. I was just going to say there is um, no more public comment. And um, I'm going to take one quick 
roll call of the commissioners to see if there's any final comments in this chapter before we adjourn. So Commissioner Manalis. Commissioner Manalis, no comments, thank you. And Alderman Russell. Alderman Russell, um, no more comments. Uh, wanted to thank Kara for calling in and some very thoughtful ideas. You know, as this moves forward, we're, we're going to be working more and more uh, sort of fleshing these things out. So I hope that we get more public comment. Um, and maybe by the time we get to the Board of Aldermen for discussion, we might actually be, you know, in the flesh. Who knows? We're all hopeful. Um, but great discussion tonight, great work on this really critically important section. Thank you. Yeah. This was, um, when I saw that it was a single chapter, I thought, oh, how much time is it going to take thinking that we go through it really fast, but it was such a rich, rich uh, chapter and a great discussion. And I really appreciate, appreciate all the effort of the planning staff on this. And, and I, I'm, and once again, I'm very um, much looking forward to these uh, conservation districts and building the framework in order to um, start to put these pieces in place to ensure the preservation of our community character. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.